Winds at the surface in excess of 140 miles an hour, which is equivalent to an EF3 tornado, 15,000 feet above the surface. It's superheated gases and flaming gases getting lifted into this violently rotating column of air. The sun is almost entirely blotted out by the, the smoke. It's, you know, this hellscape of midnight at noon and, and raining fire. I, I can't last too long here. Okay, if you can get out safely, get out, okay? I can't. Can I give you my wife's phone number? Tell her I love her. This is the fire tornado. My name is Neil Leroux. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Nevada, Reno, and I'm an atmospheric scientist. And we're here to talk about fire weather and in particular fire tornadoes. When we're talking about winds of 140 miles an hour, I, people don't really understand just how strong that is. We're talking about lofting cars off of the ground. We're talking about crumpling large steel structures, potentially ripping roofs off houses. Um, and then you add that with flaming gases and intense combustion. And uh, we're, we're talking about really, you know, one of, one of the most extreme sort of phenomena that you can, you can witness. Fire was whipped up into a, a whirlwind of activity, uh, you know, uprooting trees, moving vehicles, moving parts of roadways. So let's talk about how fire tornadoes form. True fire tornadoes have only been documented now twice, once in Redding, California during the car fire and once in Canberra, Australia during 2003. The unique um, aspect of the, of the car fire was the, the presence of these kind of ambient shear winds in the environment and that that was really setting the stage for the development of this tornado. An updraft is simply a rising current of air in this case generated by the heat of the fire. We know that hot air rises, and so we're putting a huge amount of heat into the atmosphere right above the fire, and all of that air is going to accelerate upward. And so that's the primary updraft driven by the fire. When air flows up, it also um, necessitates air to flow in. All of the air that's going up has to be replaced from somewhere, and so it's gonna draw air in from the sides, and this is what we might call an inflow jet or a fire-induced wind, which is a horizontal wind that is essentially converging from all directions into the location of the updraft. The other thing that we're seeing in the case of the, the car fire is the presence of wind shear in the environment, which is air flowing in different directions adjacent to the other airstream. And you can picture this like a highway median with traffic going in one direction, separated from traffic going in the other direction over just a short distance. This is actually, if you picture uh, a pinwheel or something in, in this flow, actually gives you rotation in that environment. And so that's our kind of source of initial rotation. But there's something kind of interesting that's happening here that is what we would call a, a vicious cycle or positive feedback. Normally, if you don't have rotation in this big flaming column of hot gases rising off of the fire, it will readily mix with its environment. So you'll get these big eddies that form on the side of the, of the updraft that pull in colder air from the surroundings. They help cool off the air in there and dilute that air. Once you get rotation, you are no longer able to mix air into this column uh, as effectively. So it starts acting a little bit more like a chimney and the flaming can persist through a much greater depth in the atmosphere. And so it's uh, retaining its heat much better than it would be otherwise. And that's allowing it to stay stronger. The updraft is stronger, the inflow winds are stronger, and then the combustion is stronger at the surface. So really a vicious cycle here. People often confuse what we would consider to be a fire tornado with fire whirl. Maybe not all fire scientists or meteorologists exactly agree on what distinguishes between fire whirls and fire tornadoes. Fire tornadoes and fire whirls both start with strong updrafts from the fire and strong inflows uh, related to the fire itself. But fire tornadoes get even bigger because the fire is actually initiating its own weather system, helping to concentrate the rotation in the lower atmosphere. Fire tornadoes actually develop a link to what's called an overlying pyrocumulonimbus cloud, which is a fancy word for fire-generated thunderstorm. And so the 
column of hot air rising from the wildfire can actually then trigger its own weather system, its own thunderstorm. There's actually a fair bit of water vapor inside of this big smoke plume coming off of the fire. And as the plume gets higher and higher in the atmosphere, it eventually reaches a point that it's actually cold enough that it can no longer hold the initial amount of water that it had in. And it forces that water to go from the invisible phase into a liquid cloud droplet. And we see this as a bright white cloud that develops in the plume. Every time some of that water has to be forced into a cloud droplet, it dumps some heat back into the atmosphere. The fancy term that we have for this is latent heat or latent heat release. Latent heat release is when water changes phase from water vapor, invisible water vapor, into visible white cloud droplets. And it dumps some heat out during that process. And when you have millions of droplets doing that, that amount of heat is tremendous. And so this is what fuels an ordinary thunderstorm, uh, the heat release inside of the cloud. And so when a fire does this, it's kind of doubling the effect of the fire because we have the initial heat from the fire that's driving this big column of air going up. It gets deep enough and then it starts adding heat back into the column and it will rise even, even further into the atmosphere. And once that happens, the cloud really has a mind of its own and will, will really rapidly vertically develop. Long distance spotting is really scary in that you're throwing embers in advance of the fire, which can actually go quite some distance in front of the fire, you know, a mile in front of the fire, and these are going to start new fires. And so we can see this in Paradise, for example, where we have embers raining down from the sky and starting all sorts of new fires. This is nuts. Sometimes you'll get this pockety uh, distribution of things that did burn and things that don't burn. One house may burn because the geometry of its roof line lets these embers build up, uh, or there is a fuel bed next to the house that is very receptive to these, whereas a more irrigated surface, uh, even though those embers may be falling on it, may not ignite. And sometimes we see these green spaces and communities, um, you know, essentially be untouched by the fire, even though embers may be falling there. And then just extreme flame lengths and flames moving horizontally through, through the landscape uh, has, has really devastating impacts. Uh, in the case of fires like the Camp Fire or other strong wind-driven fires like the Tubbs Fire uh, that devastated uh, parts of San Santa Rosa, we have very strong ambient winds moving through the environment as well. And they just are pushing the flames and pushing the embers uh, in a sheet across the landscape. The houses add to the fuel significantly. Once we move into town, the fire is going to behave differently because the fuels are different. You get a change in fire behavior and a change in the strength of your updrafts, the depth of this big column of air as you move into the, into the settled area. Those houses are very rich fuel sources for a fire. You can't you know, rely on just you know, what, what we've seen in the past in, in some of these environments right now. Being cognizant of the factors that could go into forming a truly devastating fire tornado and fire-generated thunderstorms is, is an important challenge for forecasters and for fire managers to look out for these events in the future um, and ultimately try to get people out of harm's way uh, in an expedient fashion. We, we can clearly see that fires have gotten bigger. You know, we have a, a lengthening fire season globally, but also here in California. The longer fire season, the bigger fires that we're having essentially give us more opportunity to experience the range of extreme fire behaviors that are possible. And firefighters are the ones on the front line of this, and they're often relying on their experiences or the crew boss's experience with fire, how fire has behaved in that landscape in the past, what sort of behaviors you can expect from the fire. But as we see these outlier events, uh, rules of thumb or past personal experience are not going to capture the full range of potential extreme fire behaviors.